Everyone got a chair. Not quite. Now I think we, we will start. Um, I'm delighted to see you all here today and I'm very, very pleased also to see people from other institutions around, from um, Stellenbosch and UCT. I'm not so sure if anyone's here from CPUT, but it's really lovely to have a, an extended seminar program. This is the first um, seminar we're having this year and it's a seminar series which is jointly run by um, the Faculty of Arts and Tammy Schaeffer, who's the Deputy Dean of Teaching and Learning in the Faculty of Arts, is here. And her and I arrange these seminars together as the Director of Teaching and Learning in the Faculty of Arts. So, And we're very, very fortunate today to have <coughs> two speakers, one of whom um, some of you might know because she's spoken here before, that's Denise Wood. And she's an extraordinary professor here, as well as being a professor at her institution at the University of South Australia. And Leslie Swartz, who's a professor of psychology at Stellenbosch University. And I'm really delighted to, to get them together because I've been trying to get these two <laughs> together for, for three years because I've seen how much, I mean, in working very closely with both of them in research projects, how much they have in common. And I just sort of thought that they would be such a productive pair to get together. So they've, <laughs> they've just started a conversation and I'm hoping that this will lead to further communication between the two of them. So um, this seminar, is, the title of it is called Inclusive Design of Technology Enhanced Learning Environments, More Than Just Access. And Denise, when talking about it on our walk yesterday, said she thought it might be quite controversial. But I said to her that probably the people who are coming here might agree with her <laughs> ideas anyhow. Um, Denise has a, a long list of accolades behind her name, and I'm not going to go through all of it, um, which may embarrass her a little bit, but uh, she's received quite a few national awards for teaching and learning and for her work in disability studies, and she also has a, a number of national projects to do with social justice, equity, and um, disabilities and I don't know where she gets all the energy but she does and um, as well as this I believe she's also just won the teaching and learning award and the research award at, at her university so congratulations to you. Um, we're really looking forward to hear what you have to say I always find Denise's presentations to be very interesting um, one thing she does have is problems with being concise, so I'm going to have to <laughs> rely on the audience also to indicate to her in 30 minutes that she must start finishing off because we also want to hear what Leslie has to say in response and I'm sure we would also like to ask questions. So welcome Denise and we're really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. And the time starts now. <laughs> Thanks Urban. It's always a delight to come back here and to share some of the projects that we've been working on with you and to hear about some of the wonderful work that you're doing here. Today I want to, I guess, problematise the language around inclusive design, uh, complicate our understanding of it in order to arrive at a more holistic, integrated approach, I think. And I am going to, towards the end, draw on one of the national projects that Viv mentioned, which is funded by the, uh, the Australian Government Department of Education Office for Learning and Teaching, which is, uh, in fact, on that very topic, inclusive de design of technology-enhanced learning. Um, and those of you who are interested in that project, I think we've made some time, Viv, uh, for people to come and talk yes. to me later in the week. Uh, we're also interested in other institutions that want to come on board with this project. So I'll talk a little bit more about that as, as time goes on. All right, so first of all, I want to begin with con uh, contesting some of the current discourses in inclusive education and that language. 
Now there's various definitions, but I've taken this particular one from GARD in 2011, which is inclusive education can be defined as the right of every child and young person to access mainstream education, regardless of their abilities, be that race, gender, nationality, or any other factor. <laughs> and of course we are well aware that it is uh, an international agenda. We've seen a range of international initiatives such as the UN Millennium Development Goals, the UNESCO's Education for All and of course also the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities um, and South Africa was of course one of the early signatories to that convention. Um, and here's just one of the important articles that I guess highlights where inclusive education fits within that convention, and that is the right to persons with disabilities to education, uh, realising this right without discrimination on the basis of equal opportunity and so on. And within implicit in that is the role that the state must play in ensuring that everyone with a disability has those rights fulfilled. So we might say, well, this is all a good thing, and it is overall. However, there are many researchers and authors who critiqued the inclusive agenda. For example, Armstrong, Spandago and Armstrong talk about the themes of social inclusion and education for all as policies that have largely been developed by first world states. And of course, we can envisage what some of the problems are with that. So drawing on the work of Homi Baba, they suggest that such policies are consistent with neoliberal forms of governance and free market forces, where assimilation of difference by an overriding imperative of technologically driven modernisation. And I think we can see evidence of some of that in the way in which inclusive education has played out. So despite the differences in the way that inclusion is defined, it's closely related to managing students by minimising disruption in regular classrooms. I'm not saying this is characteristic of all uh, examples of inclusive <coughs> education, but it is certainly evident in many classrooms of today, uh, certainly in Western countries. And Alan, furthermore, <coughs> argues that while research on inclusion has resulted in a proliferation of theories, all of you here, I'm sure, are aware of many of those theories. What he argues is there's been a failure to apply these constructs to refashioning pedagogical approaches to teaching and learning. And I guess that's the thrust of my discussion. We have to be careful that we don't get carried away with important aspects of inclusive education, which is about physical access to the technology. Um, it's also about ensuring usability of the technology. It's also about personalising the learning curriculum. But if we don't also look at transformative approaches to our teaching and learning, we're still playing into that kind of neoliberal agenda. So one of the problems with that neoliberal agenda is a move towards standardisation of inclusion, access and equity through institutional policy, which Alan argues <coughs> uh, controversially has re-territorialised difference leading to a focus on management of and herein lies my key point rather than engagement with difference <coughs> and therein lies the huge potential for us as educators to embrace diversity by transforming our approach to teaching and learning with the advantages that emerging technologies offer. All right, so challenging some of the discourses concerning able-bodied and disabled bodies. So again, perhaps controversially, because the social model of disability arose certainly out of the disability movement. However, um, and, and rightly so, it was a resistance to the medical model. But as Beckett argues, this can also perpetuate another I guess, dismembered, uh, disembodied notion of disability, um, that sense that it's still a deficit. There's still a problem. Whether you say the problem is in the individual, as in the medical model, or you say the problem is in society, it is still 
disengaging us from embracing the notion of difference and diversity. And uh, Beckett's gone further to say that it's actually perpetuating that Cartesian view of disability in, in attempting to separate impairment and disability. And many have argued that this model should be abandoned in favour of a new kind of framework which understands the experiences of people with disabilities. And I would argue that it's important that we engage with that in our teaching and learning so that all of our students are engaging with disability and valuing diversity. And I particularly <laughs> like the work of Gable and Peters who have argued for the biosocial bio theorising, which is recognising that it's a combination of the bio and the social, with the social processes that lead to physical and emotional oppression. We certainly don't want to discount the very physical experiences that people with disabilities encounter, but we can't do that in isolation from the issues of the social. So, Goggin and Newell talk about this as being a move away from the tragic view of disability, that negative view, that deficit model that's underpinned the medical model and has shifted that to the social model by looking at society as, as where the deficit lies. So, but it does so in a way that doesn't, as Goggin and Newell talk about, threatening the collective power of the social model. Because we recognise that people um, have been very effective, the disability movement has been very effective in uh, introducing change. But there is a problem with that as well, and that is that not all people with disabilities are identified as having a disability. Uh, and many, many authors will argue that. Um, because again, we're ending up going back to the binary divide, the essentialist arguments, which is what we're trying to fight against. Uh, and, of course, everyone is different. Some people with impairments resist identification, others identify by some aspect of their experience, such as gender, ethnicity, social class. Uh, and Wendell <coughs> talks about the fluid nature, and we recognise that in ourselves, don't we? We identify in different ways, in different circumstances. Sometimes we come together to form a movement, and we prefer to identify as part of that movement, but for a particular purpose. So we need to recognise that it, you know, move away from the essentialist uh, view of disability to viewing it as a very fluid experience, just like all aspects of diversity tend to be fluid. So it's about problematising that language. Um, and some don't think of themselves as disabled, inverted commas, but as members of a linguistic and cultural minority. Um, for example, some people with hearing impairment, like the capital D, I am part of the deaf community, and they believe that their sign language is a very rich linguistic means in which they can communicate, and they regard us as perhaps having some deficits in not being able to share the richness. And of course, I, I know we've got at least one person here that does sign, probably more, and any of you that have sat and, and watched carefully <coughs> signing will know that it's a very emotive, very rich uh, language, and they don't want to abandon that. Um, others, for example, who are uh, on the spectrum, autism spectrum, don't consider themselves as having a disability. They consider themselves as members of a neurodiverse community. And in fact, again, they see us, us as in some way wanting in some way having a deficit because we don't experience the rich sensory experiences that they, that they engage with as a community. Um, so, and here's a lovely uh, quote to sort of capture that. Autism is a way of being. It is pervasive. It <coughs> colours every experience, every sensation, perception, thought, emotion and encounter. It is not possible to separate the person from the autism. And if you ever look at any of the listservs or the discussion forums or the blogs that are uh, conducted, facilitated by people with autism, you'll begin to understand how much they 
see that as who they are, who they, and they actually see medicalization and all of the rhetoric around cures for autism as killing who they are. Uh, and in fact, they use that language uh, on many of those blogs. Um, and there's, of course, been increasing engagement with people with disabilities with online communities, exploring the intersection and interaction of disability and impairment. And I think um, many of you are well aware of the work, and I, I don't want to go over it in detail because of time, um, but I have done a lot of uh, ethnographic work in 3D virtual worlds such as Second Life. Uh, it's estimated that something like 20% of the population in Second Life are people with disabilities. That's judged, of course, on membership of uh, disability-related support groups. It's really hard to get a, a full handle on that. But it's certainly people that identify in some way with disability. So I think my experiences in that virtual world really reflect some of the things I'm now talking about. For example, this person over here, Aliha, runs, is the facilitator of a delightful group called Gimp Girl, uh, which has a presence in both the virtual and, uh, and in social media, Facebook and so on. Now notice that Aliha is in a virtual wheelchair in, in this particular shot, and here she is dancing with Nick, who is uh, a guy with muscular dystrophy, who she's since married, um, in real life, not <laughs> just in the virtual. Uh, but notice neither of them uh, want to be presented as, in, uh, as needing any kind of assistive technology. That's what I mean by the fluid nature, and I think virtual worlds allow people to explore the fluidity of their identity in rich and interesting ways. Um, Others, like uh, one of the people I interviewed, Unmasked Shepherd is her name, uh, always appears as a furry but will not disclose her disability and doesn't understand why anyone would want to do so when you can have the freedom. On the other side of things, we've got Simon Walsh, who's a well-known um, uh, activist, both in real life and in the virtual <coughs> world, um, and he sees freakism as a power dimension, if we draw on the work of Foucault, for example, um, and he is able to deflect the gaze through his um, behaviour both in real life and in the virtual world. Now Simon always appears, always, in the same identity as someone in a wheelchair wearing a helmet, because that's who he is in his physical life and that's how he chooses to identify in the virtual. So really what I've reinforced is that the, the very fluid nature of diversity and disability in particular and problematising some of the discourses that I've already unpacked for you. So what does that mean in terms of refashioning our teaching and learning? I mentioned that I, this does draw on an OLT funded um, project. Now, I do have problems with the whole notion of the widening participation agenda, not in terms of the <coughs> benefits that may flow for that for people from diverse backgrounds, but rather, again, one could construct that in terms or deconstruct that in terms of neoliberalism. Um, we don't have time to unpack that, but it's not hard to see that risk of that playing out in inclusive education, certainly in the Australian context. And so one of the things that um, emerged once the agenda was sort of beginning to roll out was how were some of the sandstone institutions who typically had not engaged with students from such diverse backgrounds, <coughs> how were they going to manage, and that's that same language again, how are they going to manage such a diverse student population instead of engaging with how can we embrace the richness that that will bring to our classrooms. So again, you can look at any of these agendas in two, in two frames of mind. And my position is that if we focus on the benefits that can flow and problematise and are aware of some of the risks involved, we can move forward <coughs> on a very positive agenda. Um, so again, I've done a significant amount of research with students in higher education, as I'm sure many, many of you have. And of course, we've problematised all of the language around 
uh, the digital native, the so-called digital native. We know that doesn't hold true. We know there's an enormous diversity of the ways in which our young people are also engaging with technology. So that's another thing that needs to be unpacked whenever we start to talk about inclusive technology enhanced learning. We are not talking about a homogeneous group, even if we are talking about students who don't come from some of these special equity categories. We are still talking about an incredibly diverse student body. So we need to move away from identifying this student from that student as somehow a deficit approach and start to engage with the fact that all our students are different, all of them are unique. And technology has moved to the point where we can truly begin to look at personalising the learning environment in a way that is engaging. I don't want to go into detail about what personalised learning environments are, except to highlight the fact that, again, we have a problem with the language. Many universities are now using the language personalised learning environment, and it still, I would say, falls into the neoliberal view of the ways in which it's a, a rhetoric, but in fact the way it plays out with their still learning management systems that are institutionally controlled, no matter how you cut it. We know it is possible to create a personalised learning environment. I don't have an issue with that. I think it's a very interesting and direction that we're heading. The problem I have is in the way in which the language is currently being used. Learning analytics is another one which you can look at in two ways. You can either say it is surveillance, it is Big Brother watching our students, or you can engage with learning analytics in a positive way and you can use it to help shape your own teaching. And you can share that information with your students to engage them in the ability to manage their, their own learning. It's about personalising the learning to the point where the student is in control and can make rational decisions based on what those learning analytics tell us. Accessibility. No one would deny that making sure our learning environments are accessible to students with diverse needs is not a fundamental right of all students. However, we have to be careful that in focusing on the technology and access, we don't forget that there are many other dimensions that are required for a truly inclusive curriculum. In the same way that usability and by usability, I differentiate that from accessibility, though the two are related. By usability, I mean the ability for students, any student, to be able to navigate their learning environment effectively and in a way that suits their needs. But again, if you look at the language around usability, it's factors such as learnability, efficiency, memorability, productivity and task of completion still very much uh, in a particular agenda and I think we have to unpack that and problematise that language in itself. And this leads me to what I consider is a move towards a far more personalised learning environment. This is one of the artefacts that are going to hopefully come out of our project and it's built on a project that uh, Professor Greg van der Heiden at the Trace Rehabilitation Centre uh, in the US, US has been working on called the Global Public Inclusive Infrastructure, which is an awful mouthful. But schematically what it looks like is the user can log into the cloud, we're all comfortable now, we're all using the cloud, can establish their own particular profile. And that might mean, if you have a disability, it might mean I really need, I like to have very high contrast and 40 point font size, thank you very much. Or I need speech output um, because I'm blind and I can't see the screen. Or I have a cognitive impairment, I really want simple screens please, not all of the clutter. Now the, the project that came out of the Trace Centre has been experimenting and I've been able to demo it in various venues and it's quite an amazing system whereby even something like Gmail, which is actually quite a complex interface if you're not savvy with technology, is stripped down to just you know the inbox, the outbox and the sent box in a beautiful clean. And that is Gmail that they're using, but they're overlaying it in the screen. So we are working with Green <coughs> on the development of a prototype of that which is integrated into learning management systems. We're starting with Moodle, 
uh, and then we hope that the model will be picked up by other, you know, uh, Blackboard and so on. And the idea is that students will be able to log in, set up their own pro profile, which will be saved on a secure database server. That will integrate with the learning management system and deliver to whatever technology they're using, whether it's a tablet, whether it's a mobile device, whether it's a computer, in a format that best meets their, meets their needs. But of course, that's only on the technology front. We still need one last piece to the puzzle, and that is the pedagogical considerations. So yes, we can deal with the technology, but what we do need to do is open up new territories for students and look at the affordances of some of the emerging technologies offer us to engage our, all of our students in understanding and appreciating diversity. So by affordance, I simply mean the perceived and taking from Norman and actual properties of an e-learning technology that determine how that can be best used effectively in online learning and teaching. Uh, Web 2, of course, opens up all sorts of opportunities for students to engage together as we move now to even things like MOOCs. You know, the whole boundary between, you know, the different um, diverse groups are opening up as, as students can engage with each other across cultures and across global boundaries. Um, I've mentioned briefly Virtual Worlds that offers all sorts of opportunities for students to experience diversity in all its many facets that are found in the virtual world. And um, to give you, and I, I would refer you, I haven't got time to go through Savin Baden's uh, framework, but um, I've given Viv in the past the reference to this. I'm particularly use, interested in her particular model particularly cluster six, which is where I think we need to be by now, which is transformation and social reform. Teachers awaken students to value um, uh, and understand how ideology, ideologies are embedded in texts and common practices. That's where we need to be moving to be a truly inclusive uh, education environment. Very, very quickly, um, I've spoken about this case study before, but my students went into the 3D virtual world. They work with community organisations that identify uh, as support groups for people with disabilities. And it was a service learning project where they met with their clients weekly. They had facilitated sessions with a mentor who has a disability to talk through their experiences in working with people with disabilities. The outcomes for that project in terms of the students' transformation is nothing short of remarkable. I've had students who talked of, in their feedback talked about how I learned that virtual worlds are not all about sex and gambling, that actually there are people that have needs that are being met by these virtual worlds. Others who talked about no longer judging people with HIV AIDS because they've worked with a group for that. Another group, Viv knows this example very well, of a, a, in one session a, a young student was complaining that his clients never responded to their emails. How was I ever going to meet my project deadline? And the facilitator said, and, and what's the name of your group again? Attention Deficit Disorder Group. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of textbook lesson could I give that student other than having the student engage with difference at that level? Um, I'm not going to go into... I've used cultural historical activity theory as a way in which I've been able to, to look at the student's institutional kind of context and their learning the communities within which they're working and where there is that crossover and identifying the contradictions, exposing those contradictions and engaging the students in that discussion. So just to conclude, what I've tried to do is demonstrate in a very brief way the potential of technology enhanced learning environments I've learned uh, as spaces that can support student diversity through inclusive design practices, acknowledging multiple layers of equity. I talked about the fluid nature of diversity and the need to engage students in activities that promote that deeper reflection and experience of diversity to disrupt preconceived conceived notions of identity and difference. As Cooper argues, inclusive education 
is not simply achieved by providing equal access to education in mainstream environments, which I would say the widening participation agenda is all about. It demands <coughs> new forms of knowing disability and disablement. It demands a politics of discourse and recognition. So there is a need and opportunity for further research that looks about the opportunities that these emerging technologies afford for engaging our students that in ways that provoke debate, discussion, reflection regarding disability and diversity. And here's my model, which is a more holistic view of what inclusive design means. Yes, we need a personalised learning environment that is responsive to individual needs. Yes, it needs to be accessible. It needs to be responsive, as in a responsive learning system. It needs to be usability, usable, but it also needs to engage with transformative pedagogy. Without all of those components, I don't believe we can have a truly inclusive design. So as Will Gibson's once suggested, the future's arrived, it's just not evenly distributed. Our role as educators in inclusive education is to find ways to engage with that difference. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, you're a bit far away. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe I'm a smooth so I can. A little chair. So I have like a little chair. And you can have a big chair. Oh, you can have equal. <laughs> <laughs> equal. <laughs> I like it. I like it, yes. <laughs> Equality and all of that, yes. I'm sure we're embodying some, something like that. Yes, I'm sure we are. <laughs> Well, I'm very, I'm very cross with, with you for keeping to time because I thought that maybe you'd go over time and I wouldn't have to say anything. <laughs> but um, no, thank you. Thank you so much. It's also a matter of some sort of terror when you're uh, discussing yes. it and you, and, and you sort of look for the, like, where's the key point of difference where I can appear so very clever and I couldn't be fine. <laughs> so, <laughs> you are allowed to appear. <laughs> I'm allowed, I'm allowed, I, I very much, I really enjoyed that. Thank you. And, and uh, it's a pleasure to meet you all the yes, time. Yes, indeed. And, Having read your, your your work and so on, which um, I find fascinating, and, and uh, the, the astonishing kind of way in which you're able so easily to to be theoretically rich and and practically informed, I think is certainly a model for me. Um, so I've just got some some small um, points that I'd, I'd like to make, really mm. in, in support of, of, of what you talk about, and, and, and maybe to link some of them to some of the issues that that we face. Um, uh, here in South Africa. I mean, just to start with the, the social model, I mean, one, one of the issues for me about the, the social model and the issue of, of disembodiment, uh, and this is certainly not original, but I mean, a lot of the, I think the best criticism of the social model comes from feminist mm. disability studies for, for very good reason. Yes. Um, and I, I mean, this is an issue that I want to talk about in, in relation to another issue. <coughs> you know, the, the problem that the the, the medical model sort of just sees the body and the social model in some senses denies it. And I, yes. I think it's partly because the activism around the social model was so mm. masculine <laughs> in, uh, yeah. in, in, in so many ways. So it, it, it demanded a, a kind of glib equality which denied the realities yeah. of, of embodiment yeah. and so on. And I think, I think that, that um, you know, what where the social model has done us down, as earlier forms of feminism have done us down, is, is in um, ignoring gender dimensions, ignoring care, <coughs> which is obviously underlying a lot of mm. what you're talking mm. about. What, what actually enables people to get to the virtual worlds? How, mm. how do they get there? I mean, you were mm. talking about getting a bed, and we were talking before this, about getting a bed for somebody from one place to another, and the equipment that's involved. And, you know, th these are physical, visceral, yeah things which, which tend to be effaced, I think, yes, in, in, yes. in a lot of the sort of easy politics um, around uh, disability. You know, it's, 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 uh, I think it's a much more general issue than disability identity with aging populations, um, aging student populations, uh, and so on. I, I think it's something which we, we really don't, don't think about enough. I was also interested in, um, in your talking about um, 
re-territorializing difference. And I mean, I, for me, one of the, and I've come rather tentatively and in an embarrassed way, and rather late to, to this view, but one of the things I'm thinking about at the moment is the extent to which provision for disability in South Africa is built on apartheid yeah. base. And on, our, on so we've translated mm. various terms, but, but we love these rigid kind of yeah. distinctions. Yeah. We, 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 we've uh, changed them. But a lot of the provision that we have does come, in fact, from, from a lot of the services that we have, in fact, were services for white people. Mm. Uh, and that's and what distinguishes South Africa from many other countries in Africa. We have better disability provision but because, we, because we had a, an agenda which actually supported disabled white people. And it's a hard thing to talk about because mm. the discourse of disability in, this, in South Africa is so linked to yeah. more general discourses. But I think it has certain kind of educational um, um, consequences. So our, our desire to be equal in a, in a trivial way, which I think in some ways the social model also did, um, denies bodily reality. So for, I'll just give an example. There's, I'm working with a... A, uh, a school in Cape Town which used to cater only for children with cerebral palsy um, who had particular kind of needs in terms of um, uh, physical needs in terms of activity and so on. They're now they've been integrated because these you know we can't bear any <coughs> difference and so on in South Africa. So they're all integrated. Most of the children in the in the, in the school now have intellectual disability um, and are from a physical point of view don't face sort of physical challenges. And so all the resources that used to be there, so now the children with cerebral palsy in fact are in a, in a minority, and resources for physical activity for children with, mm. with cerebral palsy have disappeared because they're now a minority and we don't provide mm. for them. So there's a sort of management of, of, of broader groups of people which seems to, to, to make a lot of sense in some ways, but it effaces yeah. the, the reality, the, the complexity, the richness, uh, the, the um, diversity. It plays on in all sorts of ways. At our university, one of the issues that we have to deal with, I come from Stellenbosch University, and one of the big issues that, that we have to face is the issue of access on the basis of language. And one of the techniques that we've chosen is, um, and I'm very proud of this, is that um, in some of our faculties, including my own, we, we do a very difficult thing, which is we teach in a, in a multilingual classroom, largely bilingual, it's largely default English mm -hmm. and Afrikaans. We code switch, we provide materials both in English and, and in Afrikaans. We have some tutorials, in fact, which allow access for course and so on. This is all great, but a deaf student in a, mm -hmm. in a class, who, a student who's lip reading and, and teachers, <laughs> are, teachers are code switching and, and, yeah. and we, we get these complaints. Of where, but where do these, most of our deaf students at this stage, where do they come from? They come from schools which were designed for white South Africans. They, 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 they come from a particular school system which has a particular yeah. ideological history, uh, which are very good, I must say, you know, and, and actually still provide you know, excellent kind of services. So, so we've got this sort of paradox of, mm. that of one inclusion and agenda yeah. excluding yeah. people from yeah. another point of view. Um, and other, other issues around, around this question of, of um, engagement, I mean, uh, this is my, a sort of a, a, a joke against myself and other people. I was last year. I went to a to a, a meeting um, just outside Geneva. I don't think we've been to the Brochure Institute. It's sort of right on Lake Geneva. And we all flew in from all over the world and had this wonderful meeting there in beautiful surroundings and ate wonderful food. And what we were discussing there was about the, the health system in the cloud. Uh, it was about non-communicable diseases and how we needed to to provide virtual access and people would get access through their mobile phones and we didn't need to bring services to people and so on. But what were we all doing there? Mm -hmm. You know, there was something about, I mean, uh, you know, it, it was okay for us, the experts, yeah. to all have to fly to Geneva, yeah. Yeah. But, it, but, but we can provide services yeah. remotely. Yeah. And so I, I worry a bit <coughs> about these technologies in some ways mm -hmm. as, as a defense against corporeal engagement yeah. and a defense against mm -hmm. care, which fits in with what you were mm -hmm. talking about in terms of managing diversity. Yeah. So, you know, often, certainly in, in, in my department, when people talk about using 
using the word, but it's always seen as a way of managing the halls yeah. and keeping them in place. You know, I, I, I say my role as a, as a lecturer of large undergraduate classes yeah. is a cross between a traffic cop and a clown. Yeah. So <laughs> get everybody in, sit them down, entertain them, and then get rid of them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I mean, what, what, what you're talking about, and I suppose what I'd like to sort of end with is really, you're talking about work even in this virtual world, which can so easily be invisibilized. Yes. The kind of work that you're putting in to create these new territories to support people. Um, and it's, it's work, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in how long it takes you. It, 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 when you do it, <coughs> how, you know, how, how you do it, when you're the scene, I mean, obviously, you, you know, with all your well-deserved awards and that people value, but value the work that you do, but, but is online work seen as as real work, do people feel they can interrupt you mm. during those mm. times? So I'm, I'm interested in the corporeality yeah. of your engagement in yes. in this really <coughs> exciting work because I think if that's not recognised, a lot of it can be, as you say, mm. quite mm. Sort of defensive. Mm. But I thank mm. you very much. I'm sure other people have comments. I loved your talk. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess just picking up on that on that very point, it, it, I mean that is very true. Uh, certainly, developing uh, the skill to use some of these emerging technologies is time-consuming. There's no getting away from that. It does take an enormous amount of commitment and dedication, but I think the payoffs as a teacher are very significant. And I guess that's where the energy comes from because, you know, one can continue to work the way one always has with minimal preparation and uh, you do a job, but it's not engaging for me either. Um, and it's not rewarding for me or for the students. And I think uh, sometimes, you know, that extra effort is well worth the, the effort when you, ca you kind of see the transformation. And it's, it's unknown territory, it's, it's, it's you know, scary, <laughs> to yeah. put it mildly, yeah. because you are dealing with a whole range of complexities, in, in, uh, especially in a virtual environment like Second Life, for example, where there are so many things that you can't control for. But that's where I really embrace the cultural historical activity theory, because I think that allows us to sort of visualise the activity <coughs> systems that we're working in. And, and rather than um, pull back and, and be intimidated by the fact that there are contradictions and there are conflicts that arise within these two different kinds of activity systems, is to use that as an opportunity to identify the commonalities and the contradictions and open up dialogue. And I think, by and large, we sometimes underestimate the capacity of our students. Once you give them that space to really engage with them, uh, they do open up and they do share, and it is a transformative experience, not only for them, and I think we, what's really important is to recognise, it's when I talk about transformative teaching and learning, I'm not just talking about transforming students, I'm talking about transforming and reinventing myself every time, and I, I guess that's the important thing, every investment that goes into developing an environment, and developing the classes, and the way in which you go about it, even if it's a disaster, is a learning opportunity for both of us. And I think as long as you engage in a very positive way about identifying what went wrong, why did it go wrong, and guys, help me to work it out so we do it better the next time. I think if you approach it that way, it's, it's nowhere near as such as an intimidating activity. I mean, I, I totally agree with that point, and I also, again, time is against me, but I follow an authentic learning approach in everything I do, and one of the important aspects about authentic learning is that you ensure that there is that articulation, that there is a way of bridging 
from the, uh, from the learning situation in ways that can be applied in their professional life. And I would, I would argue that you know, the sort of feedback, for example, from those students, they develop skills to develop you know, they were actually developing websites for those community organisations. Yes, they developed the technical skills, but what they appreciated as a result of that, which I do believe has transferred into their kind of professional conduct, if you like, is a much richer understanding of diversity than they possibly could have had simply by doing an arbitrary website that, as, a, as an exercise that I gave them. The convenience, I mean, service learning in general would have given them that opportunity. I'm not saying that the virtual world is, is a solution. It is one means of providing an authentic learning experience. It's no, no, by no means the only way in which we could have done that. I guess the point I'm making is not necessarily that the technology is better than providing service learning in other ways, but rather that we make use of when we are using technologies, we use them in a transformative way rather than just replicating what we might do in a classroom. So I think your point is absolutely spot on. It is absolutely important that students understand what they're doing in that virtual world, how it relates to their professional practice and to their growth individually. And as long as you can make that articulation clear, I think we can achieve that goal, yes. David didn't introduce himself, but he's a professor of maths. Oh, okay. So I was just um, wondering if you could say a little bit about what you do in schools with maths. Oh, okay. All uh, right. So we're also doing some work in um, the, the primary schools in both Limpopo province and in Pauteng. Um, one of the <coughs> challenges that uh, anyone that's familiar with the education system in South, South African schools will be aware of with, with the introduction of the CAPS curriculum is that it tends to be very atomised and it's very lockstep, you know, rigid, inflexible, doesn't allow a lot of teacher creativity. What we've started to see is that, um, that there, there's a kind of uh, pulling away from the importance of the integration of those skills and making those skills meaningful. So one of the things that we've been trialling in the schools is uh, developing a 3D virtual world that is a um, simulation, if you like, of the South African context within which the, the learners are interacting with all of the CAPS curricula. So for example, the virtual world has its own virtual currency. The children are given their own virtual currency. They undertake all of the sorts of, you know, the, the, the six subject areas within the virtual world, there's the maths, there's the English, there's the natural sciences and technology, um, the social sciences, the life skills, languages and so forth. They do that within the virtual world, but they do it in a game-like way where they're actually integrating the skills together. Um, we're still fairly early into the project and part of the challenges of course being working with the Department of Education to get them to accept uh, that you know this is another method and that it's not um, it's not disrupting their regimented classroom times but they are starting to see that there is potential for actually integrating the knowledges in a way that the, the learners can actually apply in their own lives uh, and in their own si social situations. That's, of course, a presentation in its own right, and I would be very happy to share uh, with you on another occasion uh, what that environment looks like and how the students are interacting. But most important, remembering my point about transformation being about our teaching practice as much as the learners, and what we're seeing is a transformation in some of the teaching um, and the attitudes of the teachers, and that's very exciting for me. Right. <laughs> what about assessment? Assessment in, in the virtual environment, you mean? Um, well, again, it depends on the particular subject and whether, in fact, you need to do the assessment in the virtual world. I always use virtual worlds as augmented as, as an extension to the normal curriculum. So in that case, the students are still doing their assessment within the kind of normal situation. I agree there's enormous opportunity for embedding assessment within that virtual environment. Um, I personally haven't done that, but certainly many of the teachers have. I give you an example where that's been quite effective is uh, role play simulations with health science professionals. This is in uh, uh, the, the health sciences area in uh, radiography, where the students were role playing um, 
how they would respond to patients with particular needs. And what they were able to do was video record their interactions in the role play, choose, do a formative peer review of each other's work, and then the teacher would do a summative review on the basis of the recording, and the students could nominate their best recording. And, which is, and that is the, the student feedback for that particular uh, case study was very, very positive for the students. Okay. We've got uh, four minutes left before um, two o'clock. And I just wanted to give Tammy an opportunity to thank the speakers. But uh, before that, Shirley would like to make the announcement. Uh, I just um, to say thanks, thanks so much. That was wonderful. Um, but uh, on Wednesday, there's the second uh, teaching and learning lecture um, of the year. We, we're starting at a great pace. Professor <laughs> Anne Edwards is, yeah. is with us from University of Oxford. And she's focusing on designing tasks which engage learners with knowledge. Um, so it's, a, it's really a nice link to this, mm -hmm. so it's great. And, and the venue is going to be the library auditorium. I, again, because venues are so yes. scarce, uh, whereas this one's a bit small, that one mm -hmm. might be a bit big, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll put it our energy and our spirit. But, uh, please, you're all welcome. Yeah. So that's one o'clock on Wednesday. Looking forward to that. <laughs> Thanks, Denise, for an inspiring and thought-provoking input, as usual. We've had so many seminars, and we always appreciate it. And I just want to take the opportunity to say that we, Denise gives so much to UWC, and she is it's often with very little, hopefully you do get back <laughs> one way or another, but we really appreciate it. It's been an ongoing, supportive, and instructive, and inspiring relationship, so thank you. Yes, it was delightful to yeah. responding. And I also want to, um, yeah, I'm entertaining. I've been a traffic person. <laughs> but I just wanted to um, tell people that our, every year we have a theme, and this year our theme is critical on academic literacies in teaching and learning. So I think that was a really fitting and um, wonderful start um, to kind of we'll use it as a lens to continue our engagement with the rest of the seminars. And thanks, Shirley, for mentioning mm. uh, and Edward's um, seminar that is co-hosted by mm. all three of us. And the next, we usually have these seminars once a month, but as people come through, we constantly sort of add more. And we will keep people posted, and apologies not to have a copy of our program from here, we will circulate it, but just to, 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 um, to, to profile the one after. <coughs> And we'll be, we've got on the 12th of March, um, and our seminars are usually at 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock, and we always are refreshments provided. Mm -hmm. And we always go over the time, and we yeah. always struggle with the, with, with the, the, the time management. Um, and that will be, um, we have Karen Maris. Karen Maris. Karen Maris. But it's not going to be just a, a one hour, it's That's actually a three, a three hour. hour. Yeah, on inquiry folks. Yeah. yeah. So we welcome everybody to our series and hope it's going to be a wonderful year and a transformative year. Thank you. 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 Thank